think so. Time and you know, build the world, break out the story, you know, beat by beat, figure out the chapters, and kind of have like little summaries for each one of the chapters, like a paragraph long. I do a lot of initial work that other people who are um, who don't plan, who are whatever pantsers, um, find really, really distasteful because they they feel like it takes some of the magic out of it. But then what happens with prose novels for me is like the writing of the prose becomes performance. I, I like to think of it as I'm an actor um, who has the script and you know the script has got all the words, but the, the moment I step on the stage and and introduce like physical movements and, and, and tone and, and things like that, you know, I create something that doesn't exist on the page. And there's in a, in a similar way, no matter how detailed my outline is, the writing of the story is performative and you know the the execution of it brings things out. And then of course, um, along the way, things will crop up, my characters will <laughs> suddenly decide that they don't want to do what I plan for them to do. And, and there there is magic and surprise, no matter how well you plan. Um, but yeah, I do like to plan. But with novels and verse, with poetry in general, um, it, it's a much more organic process. And I learned this with They Call Me Huero, which, um, you know, took many different forms before it finally kind of coalesced into what it is. Kind of, I mean, it's, I call it a novel in verse, but I guess it's more like a, like a series of vignettes in verse. Um, the sequel is a little bit more tightly plotted, but it's still the same sort of thing. And I, I just can't write um, poetry the same way that I write prose. It's, I have to feel some level of inspiration. There's got to be um, a sense of like immediate discovery and an uh, emotional connection that doesn't occur if I overplan things. So since I'm working on the sequel, they call me Wedo, that's what I'm doing right now is just discovering what it is. Like I have like the broad strokes understanding of what the book is about. And I'm just figuring out what the individual poems are gonna be because I like to write self-contained poems that link together to tell a broader story. And uh, Angela? Um, well, I am both illustrate and write. So when I first got into writing, images really drove the writing. I was writing words to match the images and what I imagined the story would be like. So there's still a part of me that kind of thinks like that. In the first Stella that I wrote, Stella Diaz has something to say, definitely because I thought of it as a picture book first and then it continued to evolve into a novel. I was learning how to kind of write a longer format as I was writing. And then uh, like David was mentioning, I discovered like the power of an outline uh, the power of finding story beats, these story beats that I knew very well in a picture book, but I did not know in a middle grade novel format. And so it's been a lot, a lot of planning. And I feel like it really makes me happy because I like things mighty, like tidy and organized and like knowing what things are. Um, and then the creativity really comes in and the writing and I equal writing and sketching kind of in similar in some ways. Um, you start off really, really rough and really messy and through each draft and through each revision, it becomes much clearer where your story is going and you find little discoveries or you might add something extra to the illustration. And it's just, um, that's kind of how I approach writing these novels. And I think that it's without that organization, I probably wouldn't be able to finish the whole book. Great, thank you. And Margarita? Well, um, my newest book is Your Heart, My Sky, and it's a verse novel. The subtitle is Love in a Time of Hunger. It's a young adult love story, but it's set in Cuba during the 90s in what it was called a periodo especial in tiempos de paz, the special period in times of peace. The government asked Cubans to make war types of sacrifices during peacetime, um, basically to go hungry because the Soviet Union had collapsed and the economy had plummeted. Uh, but they were hosting the Pan American Games during the summer of 1991. And that was the first summer that I was able to go back to Cuba and meet my relatives again. 
after an absence of 31 years due to travel restrictions from both countries. So it was a very emotional time for me. And I continued to go back throughout the 90s uh, with suitcases full of food because the people were so hungry and vitamins and um, other things that they asked for. Um, they wanted the poetry of Octavio Paz because he was banned in Cuba. And he wasn't banned because of anything he'd written. He was banned because of things he'd said about uh, the dictatorship. So it was, a, it was a time of great, and, and it's still a time of great hunger because the pandemic once again has destroyed the economy. So people are hungry and um, food has been rationed for 60 years. Basic supplies such as rice and beans are rationed. Everything else you just have to kind of scrounge for on the black market. And it was very interesting to me because just this morning, someone asked me, oh, the research process must have been so difficult. And well, there was no research process. This is a book, even though it's not a memoir, it's a book that I wrote from memory, from those visits and from knowing what my relatives had suffered. And, um, the process is actually more difficult than research because facing emotional memories, it can be really um, a challenge. There's, I think there's something in our minds where we sometimes try to avoid those kinds of memories. And I had gone through that with my memoirs, my verse memoirs, Enchanted Air and Soaring Earth, facing up to uh, difficult situations in my own life. But I had written about the special period and the hunger one time before for adults while it was happening during the early 90s. And that book, I went, like, for instance, I went to um, the International Book Fair in, in Argentina, and people would just yell over my head at each other, pro and and anti-communist and they wouldn't see what I was really writing about was the people, um, not the, not the uh, theoretical aspects of politics. Um, nobody is immune to hunger. It can happen in any system. I mean, there's horrible hunger all over the world in so many situations. And the pandemic certainly alerts us that we're not immune to anything. Any of the difficulties that happen in poor countries can happen in rich countries too. So I would hope that young people would read this with empathy. Uh, that would be the one thing that I would hope they could come away from it with, that nobody is immune to hunger, but everybody finds love everywhere hungry or not. That's so beautiful. Um, so thank you all three of you for sharing um, very different processes, which is great. Um, can, you, um, can you touch on sort of what motivates you to write inclusive um, literature? Uh, I know Margarita, you touched upon that some of your work is autobiographical or based on your experiences. Um, do you find that's true, um, David and Angela, for you as well? Yeah, I mean, certainly my work is rooted in the Mexican-American community here in South Texas on the border where I grew up and where I still live. And, and it's also, you know, a lot of times drawing from my own experience, they call me Guero, even though it's set in the present, draws a lot from, from my life in the 70s and 80s as a kid. Um, and you know, the reason I do that, I mean, aside from the fact that it's you know, the stories that matter to me and the community that matters to me, um, is that, you know, growing up in the 70s and 80s uh, as an avid reader um, and um, in, in somebody who, who was in libraries all the time and, and, and when I had it, some like money would go to the bookstore and try to, I mean, to the, yeah, to the bookstore and buy, try to buy stuff. Um, there, I, I never read books by, by Latinos before, by Mexican Americans. By the time I got into high school, um, there were some, some things that I read by Latin American authors in translation, 
but not by like U.S. Latinx folks, not by Mexican Americans, especially. Uh, and so, you know, th that's something I didn't really experience like that college, and it was kind of a shock to me. Um, and then when I started teaching middle school and then high school, I wanted students to not have to have that experience. But it was very difficult in the mid '90s when I started teaching to find, you know, Mexican American literature that was, you know, at their reading level and things like that. And, and it was just something that was at the back of my mind. I knew I wanted to be a writer. And slowly I felt the calling to be a writer for children. And so my immediate audience is always going to be the Mexican American kids from my community and Latinas kids in general. And then like, you know, other people who, who will benefit from reading about our culture, who will find it fun and enlightening and uplifting or like eye-opening. Um, but I'm a big believer in the fact that we reach um, an understanding of human universal or universal human truth through specific stories, stories that are rooted in place and time and a particular culture and with a particular language. And so, you know, telling stories about Mexican American kids in, in the borderlands is a way of my talking about the human experience broadly uh, that I hope is accessible to, to all children all around the world and to adults as well. Well, I think for um, me, I wanted to be an illustrator because I love stories and a lot of the work that I ended up doing in like my last semester, when I really decided I want to do children's books, I was just drawn to draw like Latino faces and I ended up drawing what I knew in a way. And so when I started illustrating, I got other people's stories and I just couldn't quite frankly relate to it as much because it was just like, well, she's Latina. She can understand this experience, but it was not like Mexican American or a Mexican experience. So, um, as I started, uh, working more, I started thinking about how I could create my own stories. And it was really, I think still a DS is something to say that was like a real pivotal moment for me. I had done some bilingual books and partly because really basic, like preschool bilingual books, because I knew growing up, you know, because uh, I struggled with language, they had me focus really just on my English. And I took speech classes until like third grade. And I had this like craving of wanting to make Spanish accessible and show that it's fun and also show it to kids like that is such a gift to be able to speak two languages from an early age. Uh, but what still is something to say, what ended up happening with that story was, you know, I came up with this character was going to do as a picture book. They couldn't understand why I had written this written about the shy character. And then when I was thinking about it and why, and it got rejected, I thought, well, this shy character was me. And then I thought about all the reasons I was shy. The fact that I was an immigrant, that I struggled with language, um, I was always afraid that I'd mess up saying something, um, feeling culturally that I didn't belong to either a Mexican culture or an American culture. Um, and I didn't fit in sometimes with kids who were spoke more Spanish than me, but they were born here because I have a Mexican mother and her her mom is from El Salvador. So she has different things and some other Mexican families too. So I kind of realized that I wrote that book for myself almost in a way to kind of like reconcile all these things I was feeling. But then when I went and it came out and then I saw people received it and it was, um, kids were loving it. I realized that there was such a need for it, that there were other kids like me, like Stella, who are shy, who feel caught between cultures. And I think to make a kid feel not alone and to feel like they have a friend through this book or for another child to have that experience of being able to say, oh, this is maybe what my friend is going through or this kid that I know at school. So I, I think that's been the bigger motivator of why I continue to write what I do. And there's nothing better than seeing like a kid raise their hand in a presentation, ask me a question. And then a teacher tells me afterwards that that child never asks anyone that they're super shy, but they saw themselves in me. And I think that is the biggest reward to writing children's literature. Margarita, did you have anything you want to add or? Well, um, just that for me, writing poetry 
is its own reward. <laughs> I love the actual process of writing poetry. And um, I'd love to, to share that with people. So I would hope that teachers, for instance, would never say to children that poetry is hard to understand <laughs> or anything like that. I would hope that if they're afraid of poetry, they would keep that secret so that it won't um, uh, be contagious and the children won't pick it up. Because I think when children are given a chance and teenagers, when they're given a chance to love poetry, they do. They may not love every poem, but they don't develop the fear of it that a lot of adults uh, have from having um, studied in a situation where they were forced to try to interpret poetry. So I just hope that teachers would say, how did the poem make you feel instead of what did the poem mean? Yeah, that's great. Um... I've seen a lot, an increase in a lot of poetry books for either young children um, also, but novels in verse over the years, which I think is really wonderful for kids. When I was informed that I was going to be the Young People's Poet Laureate, my family and friends said congratulations, but a lot of other people walked up to me and said, I don't read poetry, and they put their hands up, like, do not try and force this stuff on me. And uh, it's just something that, uh, that poets have faced. And it is, it is decreasing, I think. There are fewer people afraid of poetry than there were 10 years ago. Yeah. I mean, so isn't it true, Margarita, that I mean, part of the problem is like the past, I don't know, 50 to 70 years, there's kind of like a concerted effort by poets in academia and you know canonical poets or whatever to try to make to try to distance poetry from the people when poetry ought to be like accessible for people i mean i have nothing against like really dense literary poetry that that you know people study you know get doctorates to, to understand but what's happened i think in a lot of schools is you know english majors come into schools and and try to make students or, or inadvertently make students feel what they felt when they were in their poetry class at the college, you know, that this is opaque and hard or whatever. Um, it, you know, poetry um, as Weto's poetry teacher, uh, Ms. Wong in They Call Me Weto tells him, poetry is the clearest lens for viewing the world. And I, you know, I really, really think that's true. And people who are afraid of, po of poetry, like the, the fault for that is academia, frankly, and like the, the way, you know, we've mm, turned poetry into like this overly sacred divine thing that only, a, you know, a few uh, like almost like priestly figures can interpret for the masses. And it's unfortunate that, that we've done that. And, but I do feel like you, that things are changing. Yes, the Poetry Out Loud movement has helped a lot, I think. And Sylvia Vardell has helped because she's trained. She's uh, Hundreds of librarians all over Texas in particular love poetry because of the way it was taught. But um, anyway, that was a kind of a digression about poetry, but it is important to me. So thank you for the chance to say it. I noticed that one of the questions that um, we have is, What's one book you read that had a lasting influence on your writing? But it says read as a child or young adult. And for me, there were no children's books uh, that had anything to do with Cuba at the time when I was growing up. And in fact, I was the only Cuban American uh, that I knew in Los Angeles at that time. I knew, I mean, I have a lot of relatives in Miami, but. Um, None of my neighbors were Cuban. Alma Florada's memoirs would be the books that have had a lasting influence in that way. I didn't encounter them till I was well into my 50s. So um, when I was a child, I 
remember turning to my mother when I was about 15. I wrote poetry since I was much younger, but when I was about 15, I turned to my mother and said, you know, there's no books about Cuba. I'm, I'm going to write one someday. Mm -hmm. And she was like, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but my grandmother said, oh, to have a poet in the family is lo ultimo. It's the ultimate. It, it's like that's the goal of a Cuban family is to have a poet. <laughs> so I had a very supportive uh, background in that way. I think it's so I, I love that you've like that you've dovetailed it into this question because I was thinking about it a lot. And as I mentioned before, you know, there wasn't Mexican American or Latinx representation for me in the books I read at school, but I was also a really precocious reader. And so by the time I was in first grade, I was reading a third grade level. And by the time I was in third grade, I was reading like high school level and college level books. So I, I quickly moved from reading, you know, I didn't spend a whole lot of time in the children's books, like just when I was five or six. And then I moved into, you know, juvenile fiction. And then by the time, you know, I was in fourth or fifth grade, um, I was reading like fiction for adults. But even there, I mean, obviously there, there weren't Latinx authors either, um, you know, uh, again, there were Latin American authors in translation, but not US uh, Latinx authors. And so by the time I get to high school, what kind of replaced that for me uh, were African American authors, especially uh, women writers. Um, like uh, Toni Morrison's Beloved was super important to me when I was in high school. The Color Purple um, by Alice Walker was super important. And then probably most, maybe more influential on my writing uh, was Octavia Butler, who wrote a lot of like science fiction stuff. And she had this, um, the series of books called the Patternist series or the Patternist universe or whatever. And they were what we would consider Afrofuturism, um, though the term hadn't been, hadn't been coined at the time, I don't think. And it was, it was those books that kind of influence the way I think today that when I'm writing, whether it's, you know, realistic fiction or whether it's science fiction or fantasy, that the stories are rooted in ancestral past, um, in, you know, in uh, dreamed of alternative futures, uh, I mean, present, and then like our dreamed of futures and like that there's some kind of like thread connecting um, the dreams of ancestors in the present and then the dreams of us in the present and the future. And um, so, I mean, that influenced me a lot, but it wasn't until I got to, and it's all I was an adult, kind of like what Margarita was saying, that I really started getting influenced by authors from my own culture. And I read Santo Cisneros and then um, Tomas Rivera and, um, and like, uh, you know, Bless Me Ultima by Rudy Anaya and stuff like that, that, you know, began to, make me see that I could be doing the same kind of work in Mexican American literature for children. Um, and uh, that was really, really exciting. It was also kind of upsetting because I was like, where the heck was this stuff when I was in school? Donde demonios estaba toda esta literatura, right? Where was it all? Um, but yeah, and I mean, now the, the, I'm influenced by people that I love and respect. I mean, Margarita's novels and verse have had a huge influence on the way I think about novels and verse. Um, and oh, thank you. <laughs> you're quite welcome. You're, you're an incredible writer. Um, and Guadalupe Garcia McCall, who's I've just recently uh, co authored a book with, um, all of her work just like resonates with me in a, in a deep level. She's also a, a border kid. Um, so yeah, I mean, most of like the people that influence me now are like my peers whose work I read constantly, um, just kind of like filling that, like that hueco, that gap inside of myself that's been there since I was a child. Right now is a great time. I mean, there's, we'll talk about it. There's still problems and still a lack of representation, but there is much more literature for kids than there has ever been um, for, for kids from racialized minoritized groups. I think um, I loved reading so much as a kid and I was really drawn to um, like Judy Bloom and uh, Beverly Cleary. And uh, Ramona Quimby was the kind of child I secretly always wanted to be like. I was much louder at home, but at school, you know, obviously I was very shy and quiet. And so I feel like they have been some of the biggest influences. Um, I think what it is is just realizing that I didn't see myself. And this is a conversation we hear so often that the books we read as a child, we didn't see ourselves in. So as now it's just trying to like, put it on its head. We're keeping that same spirit or, um, 
you know, like a child who's very precocious, or we feel so much of that emotional weight of just being a child and going through the different stages of childhood, but now seeing it through the lens of a Mexican American or diversity so that these kids can see themselves in the books as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I will jump in and say that, um, one of the, um, one of the series that like really had a huge influence on me was, um, the, the time quartet by Le Engel, <laughs> uh, the, the last name, uh, you know, completely coincidental um and you know the what is it the, the I, i'm often say? asked to sign her books people <laughs> walk up to me at conferences and sit them down in front of me you think that you're letting that's great madeline <laughs> uh because your name is so close to hers but yeah like those books are wrinkle on time you know when the door. Yeah. So, so i i really um i saw myself in in the main character who's like this you know overly precocious like really really intelligent kid who can like stands out even in a really intelligent family, um, Charles Wallace, um, the family is like super white and super middle class or whatever, but they're very unusual in lots of other ways. And so, you know, what you're, what you're saying is true, Angela, like you, you, I mean, our identity isn't just our, our ethnicity, our identity is, mm -hmm. we, you know, when you're a kid and you don't see yourself, you, um, completely reflected, at least you see bits of yourself. And so as authors, I, I like what you're saying, where you like, you turn it on its head, you're like, yes, that, but Mexican American. <laughs> yeah. Well, David, I really love what you're doing with the way you give Nahuatl lessons on social media. And I think it helps to increase awareness of the need for more um, indigenous Latinx writers. I mean, people have a tendency to think of um, just pigeonholes. Like when I, had, when I went to fill out my, you know, application for a COVID vaccine, which was a really big thing in February, um, I was so nervous I had to get it right. And they wanted me to choose an ethnicity and a race and you right. couldn't leave any blanks. And I wanted to put mestiza for race because I know I have Taino DNA. I know I have indigenous DNA. And even though the culture and language aren't available to me in daily life, I wanted to say mestiza, but that wasn't an option. But I think it should be an option in, um, you know, in what children and young adults read. So I'm really excited when I see things like Jorge Teto Largueta's uh, trilingual it's picture amazing. books. I just think it's wonderful. And then um, Ari Tyson is writing, she's Bribri from Costa Rica and she's writing. Um, I think it's very important that we realize that we're, we're complex. And one of the main uh, errors that non-own voice authors make when they write about our cultures is that they oversimplify. Mm -hmm. So all Cubans are this, or all Mexicans are this. Um, instead of realizing that Cubans are Afro-Latinx, they're Chinese Cubans, ta Taino ancestry, Spanish, but Spain has multiple cultures and languages. So in Cuba, you know, they differentiated for centuries between people who came from, um, from the South and the North and from the different provinces and spoke different languages. I know my own, some of my own ancestry is from the Canary Islands. So I have one che, the, the indigenous people of the Canary Islands going back to the 15 and 1600s. And um, I just think that it's rich and varied. And I think we're ready to see that instead, what, of, what? instead of these oversimplified little kind of, it's trying to put the square pegs in the round holes when you just say, okay, everybody's the same within this group. You know, it's kind of like you can cross uh, Hispanic Heritage Month off your list. Whew, got through that one. <laughs> <laughs> that's why no, we sorry, never, it's more complicated than that yeah that's why that's why you know greater 
um, literary dignity, greater equity in publishing. You know, Latinx people make up 18% of the US population. Um, and overall, if you include adult and children's literature together, you know, fewer than 3% of the books that are being published every year are written by Latinx people. And so in order to get the richness and complexity of our identity and the multiplicity of stories that exist in our community, you know, Angela's story as an immigrant child who's whose mother, you know, like presses her to try to linguistically assimilate is different than the story, than my story as like, a, you know, Mexican American, my family being in Texas for hundreds of years, or my, my children's story, the children of an immigrant and a Mexican American who spent their lives both in Mexico and the US, like all these you know, rich complexities of identity. And as you're saying, like this, as, as it's true with Cuba, as it's true in Mexico, you know, Mexico City had the first Chinatown on the North American continent in the 1500s. Like there were uh, Filipinos and Chinese and Japanese people living in Mexico City, um, you know, shortly after the conquest. It's, it's, so the identity in Mexico is not, I mean, although most people do have indigenous heritage, there are also people with obviously with African heritage and with um, Asian heritage and, and so forth. And like, you know, living at all different social levels and with all kinds of intersectionality of identities. And um, we need more books published and publishing needs to do a better job. And it's, it's, you know, it's like turning the Titanic around to get them to do it. Um, it, it progress is really, really slow. And I know that Margarita, you, you've seen the change over, over time. You have a, a very storied uh, career, um, but, um, you know, we still have a long way to go. I think you, you would agree. I think that organizations like Las Musas have made a tremendous difference over the last few years. We're seeing books published from every, by people with ancestry from every uh, country in Latin America. And that just wasn't happening 10 years ago. What do you think, Angela, since we're on this topic? Susan's like, I'll get it. Nope, nope. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I wholeheartedly agree with all that you're saying. I think the, um, it's great to see progress on social media. I think the problem is, though, getting the publishers to put the money behind our books so that they're more visible because um, you see what other people are getting for advances or the amount of money that goes into a celebrity book and that there's a reason why that's a New York Times bestseller. So I think um, that's the part where I think the publishing company needs, publishers really need to put more effort. Because um, it's definitely easier for me to get projects sold now and that's great. Um, but I would love to see that a fraction of that same attention that they put on some of those other titles, the ones that they know will sell more easily. And the thing is that uh, our books, who, the people that love it, uh, read it, love it. So if you just put it in front of people's faces um, and shared it and didn't put any judgments on it and just said, enjoy this new book, the majority of them would love it and recommend it to somebody else. They just need to be made aware that they exist. But I think that each of us who has been published and is, is somewhat established, we, we have the opportunity through some of these new organizations. We Need Diverse Books has been quite a few years now, but they have a mentorship program and Las Musas has a mentorship program and Latinx in publishing. And so when we have time and, you know, it has to, it has to be the right timing, but the chance to mentor someone and help them get a foot in the door, um, it, it can help to diversify, uh, you know, make sure that all these different backgrounds are included. Yeah. And also different mm -hmm. types of writing. Now I get just as, you said it's easier for you to sell things. So I get just as many rejections as I ever did because I'm a poet and that's, um, you know, where the, we learn to live with that. <laughs> That's part of it. Um, but I, I do think that, you know, if 50% if of what I write gets published, that's really a lot. And Gabriel Garcia Marquez recommended that young writers 
only try to publish the best 10% of their work. But I'm not young, so if I get 50%, I'm really happy. <laughs> I, 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 I use that as one of the reasons that I waited until I was uh, 41 for, to, for my, to publish my first book, as if I had like control over that. But like when I'm talking to kids, I'll be like, you know, you there's a certain amount of writing you have to get out of your system that isn't particularly publishable because it's derivative. I mean, it may be actually like decent writing, but it it's it, you're finding your voice, you're mimicking other people, your 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 storytelling is is not particularly strong, and and you have to practice like. Uh, you know, people who are athletes, they wouldn't want videos of <laughs> their, you know, practice games when they're in their teens to be televised. Uh, it would be embarrassing for them. Like there's a certain degree of like learning that happens and you know, you, you've got to get through that. So, um, and Gabriel Garcia Marquez's advice is, is good. <laughs> Wait, get some of that out of your system before you start publishing it. <laughs> Yeah, he, he said that he had to uh, shred everything because otherwise somebody would go through his trash and publish the stuff he uh, didn't want out there. Susan, sorry. Oh, no, that's okay. I was just going to um, say, um, you know, Angela, um, I think you brought up a really good point too about the marketing of children's books. Um, you know that... Um, we're, we're working on getting more representation in publishing, but that there's sort of a whole other arm of, of um, getting books out there that, you know, people can find, um, you know, but beyond it just being sort of published. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, um, I feel like booksellers, um, are so key in getting books into people's hands and the publishers work with booksellers to, you know, have books that are showcased at their stores or online. And I feel as if they put a little bit more energy into putting diverse literature as we're going to spend this much money on marketing on them, take 10% from like the New York Times bestseller your Natalie Portman books and put it towards a diverse author, um, it would just make it more accessible. And the books that are um, diverse that have done really well, um, I feel like there's been that grassroots um, marketing that with educators and that's what's made it successful. So I think it's a combination of getting um, educators aware of the books that we make. And then on top of that, having the publishers put more money into the marketing so that when you go to your Barnes and Noble, there is showcase diverse books. And it's not there just for Hispanic Heritage Month or Latinx um, Month or Black History Month, that it's there all year long. So I think that's where we really need to have a lot of progress made. Yeah, that was it was like what I was saying about uh, American American Dirt when it first came out, um, and and we found out that you know uh, Janine Cummins had uh, essentially gotten a couple million a couple million dollars in, in advance with the sale of rights, uh, international translation rights and movie rights and stuff like that. Um, but you know her like writer advance had been really significant, and, and my argument was you know rather than investing putting all that money in one basket for one person who's writing outside of their lane, um, why not give 50,000 advances, $50,000 advances to 20 um, Latinas if you if you want to have like the, the Latina perspective, you know, to, to Chicanas, the Mexican Americans, to, to Mexican immigrants who are, who are writing these stories already, you know, acquire books from them, give them a significant advance so that they're able to write the next book and, um, you know, it, but that's just not the way publishing thinks. Publishing wants the next big thing, um, and then so that they can like earn a lot of money, and then kind of like rob from Peter to pay Paul, um, and do like their other smaller projects with mm -hmm. all the profits they get off of this. And that's why you know you see publishers rushing to publish things by controversial political figures who may have like significantly damaged I don't know um, social norms and democracy and things like that. Uh, but because they know that they'll be able to market that and sell a ton of books, um, they would they would rather you know pay a, a massive advance to 
problematic figures and and push those books and and and, and so yeah that kind of a reform is is necessary it's not enough for them to shine the, the spotlight on you know that, that one writer from a community of color per season and say look we're doing right. diversity it's like no you're not doing diversity you're playing a shell game it's all smoke and mirrors I will confess to enjoying the writing process so much more than the business end of it that um, I have a tendency to just kind of back off and and not complain and be happy with whatever I get. <laughs> because my, my great love is first draft. It's not even the published book. It's the actual process, the flow of the ink through my pen and the way time flow changes when my imagination is. is uh, I, uh, there was one description that somebody wrote about your kind of your, your chair floats up off the floor when you're writing well and you just kind of, there's no walls in the room and <laughs> Uh, that's that's the stage of the process where I feel the most comfortable and I'm really shy with the publicity end of it. Yeah, I mean, and I think that's typical of authors. I think that, that for the most part, we're, you know, um, we're introverts. Like I've, I've learned and part of it was just like my upbringing and being forced to be extroverted when I didn't want to be. But I'm very, I would like, most of my life is spent in solitude, like in, in the room with just myself. And I think that's true of a lot of authors. And I think that most of us are comfortable with that. Um, but, you know, um, you know, we do what we, we, what we can do. And I know that you're supportive, as you've already mentioned, of up and coming writers and, you know, through mentorship and other types of advocacy with um, different organizations. And, you know, we, we all do what we can do to, to further the cause and bring more voices into the fold. And, um, you know, uh, that, I, I, I'm, Susan, I'm going to like, again, jump on one of your future questions. That gets me thinking about this question that Susan had posed to us. Like, what author would we want to spend a day with? And like, you know, before the pandemic, I often spent days with authors because like most of my friends are, are authors. And so I was thinking about this, like how, I mean, I've spent, I spent an entire day with like Adam Kidwitz because I've co-authored a book with him. We spent a lot of time together. Spent a whole day with well, Lupe Garcia McCall, you know, with Angela Cervantes, with, but like, do I want to say, do I want to single any of them out? I'm gonna feel like really, like, I feel kind of shy about it, you know? First of all, do they wanna spend an entire day with me? How are they gonna feel by my saying I wanna spend an entire day? Well, the, the safe answer is to choose someone who's dead. And <laughs> I, I choose Dulce Maria Loinas. She's my favorite Cuban poet and, um, her, my favorite poem by her and my favorite line in that poem is the same as the title is En mi verso soy libre In my verse I am free That's beautiful, I like that Angela, have, did you, how did you feel about the question? Did you, could you come up with an answer? Was it hard? I mean, it is definitely hard I, um, I kind of toy in between illustrators and writers so there's many illustrators that I would spend the day with um, I have a former student, Anna Aranda, who's just a delight and, um, she's a talented artist and she's also from Mexico and I always practice my Spanish with her. So for her, I, I would enjoy spending the day with her. Um, I would say authors, uh, I really do love the work by Aaron and Trotta Kelly. I think just beautiful writing. Um, E.B. White is probably one of my favorite dead authors. Uh, <laughs> I am also lucky that um, Meg Medina does live in Richmond. So I've been able to spend time with her and uh, she's a huge inspiration. And it's nice to so have someone funny. who, went, what? She's it's wonderful. So funny. Yeah. It, well, I mean, it's it's hilarious because when I illustrated Mango Abuela and me, I was still living in San Francisco and I, um, my mom lived in Fresno. I had just taught at Fresno State as well. Um, and then I moved to New York and then met my boyfriend and we decided to move to Richmond, Virginia. And so now I get to be in the same place with the author of the book. And that's really great. And uh, it's um, inspiring to see how her career has taken off. And she was amazingly talented, so it's not a surprise at all. But I feel very lucky to be in the same place as her. 
And as long as I can choose someone dead, I will also choose someone in the future. I'd like to uh, live long enough to see what, what some of the young people who are just starting out now, what they're going to write someday and then sit and talk with them about it. Well, I wanted to, um, we're almost out of time to segue to some of the audience questions, if that's okay. I wish I could just have you guys here all evening and just, you know, grab a glass of wine and, and you know, <laughs> you guys talk. Um, but um, so I'm just kind of going to go a little bit in order. Um, and this is from Ira or Arya, uh, give your, given your experience constructing your literature, what is, was the most difficult aspect of writing? And what advice can you give to aspiring writers? I'm going, my creative writing professor was Tomas Rivera and I'm going to pass along what he taught me, which was to write from the heart, never worrying about whether it's going to be published someday. While you're writing, you're writing because you want to write, not because you expect to get rich and famous or um, be, uh, not because you want to be popular. Um, you know, if you're writing that a few years ago, the vampire stories, uh, <laughs> by the time you got it done, it, they'd switch to werewolves. So don't worry about what's popular. <laughs> write from the heart, say what you really need to say. And um, so that's, that's my advice and, and to be super perseverant. You know, it, it really hurts when people don't like what you write, you know, reviews and those things. So don't read them, just, you know, just keep writing and keep trying and you're gonna get rejections. Yeah, do, do the work that only you can do, that's all. Okay, so our, our next question comes from Melanie Hernandez. Uh, what are the greatest obstacles you face in getting your work read in K through 12 schools versus fighting, finding audiences in private settings? Well, I think it's important to note that, you know, we've talked a lot about the gatekeepers in publishing, you know, editors, agents, and, and, and just like the, the systems that focus money on a particular uh, group of books. But gatekeepers also exist at the school level, the school boards, teachers, librarians, these are people who acquire books um, or approve the acquisition of books. And so you, you get into K-12 schools when there are librarians and teachers who believe in the importance of representation. And, um, and when that, where that is not true, and there's a diverse you know, demographic um, uh, makeup, then children suffer, frankly. They, they suffer because the only mirror that in the books that they read reflects whiteness back at them rather than anything other than that. And so gatekeepers at the school level are, are you know, those people have to be on the side of literary dignity and, and equity and representation in order for real change to be effective. 10 years ago, um, people would argue with me at ALA or NCTE, you know, librarians and, and uh, teachers would argue with me if I said reluctant readers love verse novels, reluctant readers like white space. It's inviting, it's inviting. You can hand them this book and tell them it's only gonna take you an hour to read the whole thing. And yet it's not a baby book. It has um, sophisticated, you know, young adult um, topics, uh, things to think about. It's challenging in that way, but not in the reading. The reading is straightforward and easy to understand. And um, people argued with me. And I find that just repeating myself year after year after year, suddenly I started to hear them saying what I used to say as their own idea. Uh, they were saying reluctant readers love verse novels. The white space is inviting enough. They were listening. <laughs> and I'm, I'm really happy that, that it's their idea now. So um, I think that 
uh, again, perseverance. Angela, did you have anything you wanted to add? I would say that I feel lucky that I think educators have been some of the most supportive. I'm not saying that that's the case in all cities and all states, but um, they have really embraced the books that I have done. And they're the ones that are doing so much of the important work out there of, um, you know, just representation and making kids feel seen and, uh, I did a, one book when school and they were talking about the importance of own voices. And it's one thing for us all to be talking about it, but it's quite another thing for uh, educators to be talking to that with their students. So I think just continuing that dialogue and um, exposing and like Margarita was saying, perseverance, because the more that we say it, the more that will be heard. Great. Did you, or is there anything you guys want to add before I move to the closing for the event? Do we have time? You had asked us what our next projects were. Do we have time yeah, for that? If you, yeah, if you want to talk a little bit about your next projects, that would be great. Okay. Okay. Well, you've already mentioned my picture books that are coming out uh, in August and uh, in October. Uh, the one coming out in August is there. It's illustrated by Sara Palacios, and this is not a, a finished um, cover illustration. We made his, his shirt now has sleeves. It's more of a guayabera instead of a, a t-shirt, but um, it's about the singing vendors, los pregoneros uh, in Cuba, when uh, traditionally, when people are selling something on the street, fruit and vegetables or, or candy or anything, they sing about it and they sing to invite you to come and buy. Um, but this was made illegal for uh, several decades because it was private enterprise and it was outlawed along with all other capitalism. And it's uh, back now, it's legal again. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of food to sell, but I wanted to honor the tradition of the singing vendors. And then Light for All with uh, Raul Colon illustrating is about the Statue of Liberty and it's what it represents uh, in terms of equality and, and hope and freedom for all. And um, my next first novel is Rima's Revolution. It's coming out in early 2022. And it's about the suffrage mu movement in Cuba, which was through the 1920s and the vote wasn't actually gained until the 30s. But the suffrage movement in Cuba was simultaneous with uh, campaigning against the divorce law, which allowed men to kill either their wives or their daughters if they found them with a lover. It was legal, they weren't punished. It was, you know, femicide has been traditionally legal throughout Latin America. And with the struggle to have illegitimate children uh, gain rights and with the struggle against a dictator who had taken over. So it's really complex. Um, it sounds like a very complex situation, but it's focused and it's just written in one voice. It's one young woman's struggle to overcome all these obstacles. And again, perseverance. <laughs> Angela, what do you have coming up? Um, so I'm working on the fourth Stella, Stella Diaz to the Rescue. That comes out March uh, 2022. I just finished a picture book that will come out in January called um, Tengo Hambre. It's about a dinosaur who's hungry. And so that's more preschool. Um, and the how are you or como estas and how do you say or como se dice are both coming out in board books in January. And uh, I'm working on another picture book that will come out also in January, but I can't talk about the author quite yet. <laughs> and I have, I have three books coming out in the rest of this year. So my debut picture book is coming out from Coquila, Penguin Random House um, in August. That's my two border towns. Um, and it's coming out simultaneously in Spanish as Mis Dos Pueblos from Terizos. Um, I did the Spanish version as well. 
Then in October, the graphic novel, the first in the graphic novel series that I'm doing with Raul the Third, Raul Gonzalez, um, Clockwork Curandera, is coming from Lee and Lowe's two books in print. Um, and this first volume is called The, the Witch Owl Parliament. Uh, in, in Spanish, it's a Parlamento de Lechuzas. And um, then that's, that's a YA graphic novel. And then in November, the, the final book in the 13th Street series, my chapter book series, is coming from Harper Collins. So, um, and then, um, you know, I have, as both of the other uh, panelists do, have multiple projects that haven't quite been announced yet that'll be coming out in the next few years that I will get in a lot of trouble if I mention, but there's, I have several really, really cool things about to be announced, so I'm excited about that. And I just say that you all are incredibly prolific. <laughs> um, I this as you I was pick, writing you picked bio. three really prolific authors to be on this panel and I saw I was like oh we do a lot of work <laughs> if you uh, can't all our rejected work too or even more prolific exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but first of all I want to thank our wonderful speakers for taking the time out of what I'm sure is a very busy busy day um and so I'd also like to thank um, Alan and Jason, our ASL interpreters for being here and um, for Karina to, for helping out with the event. Um, and then, you know, finally, I'd like to thank all of you um, for being here and, and also taking time out of your busy schedule or, you know, Zoom fatigue. Um, this has been really great. This has been a great event. And so I'm glad everyone was here to make it so. Um, and if you are a Fresno student, um, you can fill out this short survey that's going to be entered in the chat, I think by Karina, and you could win a gift card to a local restaurant. And then finally, if you um, would like to be added to the Arnie Nixon Center mailing list, you can send an email directly to me, which thanks Karina, she just put in the chat for me. Um, and we will definitely add you to our mailing list. And I promise we don't spam people because I write them. So I can guarantee you we don't spam people in our email list. I just wanted to do a quick shout out to the comments section. It was um, especially from, I think uh, someone has a fan, uh, Lila Nubia and Reyes and uh, Aida and Larissa as well. Thank you. All right, well, if no one has anything else to say, um, thank you again. And um, I hope you all have a wonderful evening and rest of your week. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Susan. Thank you for inviting Bye. us. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, Jason. Yeah. Bye. 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 Bye.